Bowman back with us. Welcome along, mate. Great to have you back here. We're talking once again about fishing for our native freshwater species, which of course is your bag, mate. So all about cod and yellows and with cod season kicking off again tomorrow. Surprised you got time to talk to us, mate. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, good to be back. And yeah, cod season's just a few hours away. You can see I'm already dressed, ready to go. Not so casual this time, but yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see what the weather does. But yeah, let's talk some fishing. Got the sun protective gear on, mate. You got the bright lights above you, just you know, keeping the uh, keeping the lights off your head. It's all, all good, mate. We're going to have a bit of a chat, just uh, generally for the next couple of minutes. Give people a bit of an opportunity to come into the room. Those that are joining us, we're on about five different Facebook pages at the moment. We're on YouTube as well. We're on the Doc Lewis website. So say hello. Let us know where you're coming in from. We've got Bot Bot coming in from YouTube. There wants to know what's the best cheese, mate. I'm guessing you might know who this character is. Uh, we've got Brad Passfield coming in. Good to have you here, Brad. Uh, it should be a good session. I'm sure Brad will have plenty to uh, to ask and plenty to contribute. So, Roman, tell us, mate, start of the cod season, where are you going to be fishing those first couple of days? We're going to have people following you around all over the place. Oh, they, they probably do anyway. Um, <laughs> well, it really depends on the weather. Um, I might go down to the river. Um, I might go to Googong. Well, I will go to Googong. It's just a question of how often I go to Googong or not. But the idea is just to head out do some sounding and um, find some of the fish and habitat for that for those fish because the dam's risen a lot. So it's going to be a bit of a change actually because the water's been quite low for some time and now we've had all that rain, so it's a new dam and a perfect um, time to talk about side scanning and searching for those natives. Yeah, yeah. Because last time we really focused on that vertical fishing, we'll probably talk about that again tonight as well, of course, because that's something that you do particularly well but yeah we didn't talk much about side scan last time because it just wasn't, wasn't really appropriate for the circumstances but when we spoke on the podcast yeah well, what two or three weeks ago i suppose maybe even more i don't know but you were saying then that uh googong was rapidly rising uh water levels were coming up water was getting a bit colored and the fish were starting to come on the chew where is it now mate oh well, it's over 100 percent. it's probably a touch over obviously if it's spilling over yeah. um hmm. Yeah, the yellows um, for the springtime um, had about three false starts. It, it got warm and then rain, cold, yep. and then murky, <laughs> and then happened again. And, you know, it's been very up and down in a lot of storages, actually, in terms of um, golden perch. Even Windermere has been a, a very tough from what I hear, too. So, yeah, it's, I think summer's a, um, a godsend for everybody. We've got that really hot weather coming, so it ain't going to get cold from here on in. So No, no, yeah. you're not going to get cold, and hopefully the fishing's going to be hot too. That's what we're all hoping for. So, yeah, all right. Yeah. So, um, Googong, when it's full, mate, tell us about the types of structure where the cod tend to hang out. So we're, you know, we're coming into the warmer months. That rain came fairly late in the season, so we got you got rain down there. You know, towards the end of spring, the lake's full, the water's warming up. What does that mean? Are the cod going to be on the chew? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't had three months, you know, haven't fished for them for three months, so mm -hmm. a lot can change. Um, whenever there's a big change stuff, like yeah. that, yeah, yeah. So whenever there's a big change like that, it's either really good or really bad. It's it's, it's hard to have a happy medium, um, but I'm tipping it's going to be quite a good one. Uh, the habitat in Googong is very mixed, actually. Um, so originally when it was um, uh, dammed, it was felled, so most of the timber or all the timber was gone. Um, over the past couple of decades, you've had a few trees grow, and um, luckily in the last flood, all the tannin or most of the tannins all leached out many, many years ago. So when the water's yep. coming in now, you're not getting that real dirty stuff. It's more that Stay slight clean, yeah. tannin. Mm. Um, so, yeah, at the moment you've got, you've got your classic rock walls. There's actually a fair few than appears to the naked eye. Um, when you go and look at it just from, you know, boat ramp view or getting up a little bit higher, um, you can see that it's similar to like Blowering or Windermere where um, there are some steep banks, but then it's fairly gradual. So it's almost um, like farmy looking on the edges, but um, there is a fair few rock um, beds and clusters and a couple even walls that are underwater. Um, hmm. And that's the whole idea about what we're talking about is side scanning, be able to find 
that structure. And of course, you've got little bushes and stuff as well. So you've got pine trees, you've got other little sticks and bits and pieces, but you don't have that real solid timber. Like, for example, Burrenjuk, Burrendong, even Windermere has. So finding yep. the golden perch or finding the natives can be a little bit more tricky, especially when the water is. Um, a little bit turned up, so you've got a little bit of um, algae, you've got a little bit of matter flowing through the water column. Um, it can really affect your readings as well, so you really do have to focus um, in great detail sometimes when you come up to some of this spindly stuff and coupled with all that flow and all that crap basically in the water. Yep, yep. All right, so there's the rundown. Could be good, could be tough. I guess we'll know in the next couple of days. But, mate, we've got a few people in the room now. We've given people the opportunity to come in. And thanks to everybody that's touched base. Let us know that you're hearing us because, of course, it's always tough. We can only see each other. We can't see you guys. And uh, and so we like to know that we are being heard. So, mate, it's time to start talking cod. Let's pull up a few screenshots to get things going. Folks at home, uh, remember that this is a sonar masterclass, but we're not limited to talking just about sonar. So if you've got questions about cod and yellows that aren't sonar related, feel free to ask those as well. If you've got questions that are sonar related, well, obviously, um, Roman is the man. He's going to answer all of those for us. And uh, hopefully we'll have a great session and you'll go away feeling well informed and ready to hit the cod season running. So, mate, I'm looking at our screenshots and what do you know? They're not in the right order. So just give me a second here to get things set up for us. And while Greg's doing that, everybody, just bear in mind, we may be focusing on Gugong for our examples, but dams of um, native nature, this applies to all of them essentially so when you're searching for stuff particularly so just keep that in mind it's not just about one dam even if i'm referencing google on a fair bit mm, mm, good point yep so a lot of this stuff applies wherever you fish all right mate i'll bring that screenshot back up and make it a bit bigger again and you've got a you've got a series of shots we're going to go through here to set the scene for us so i'm just going to hand the microphone over to you mate you can tell us all about what we're looking at Sure, no worries. Um, people in the last um, masterclass I did here would um, have seen a couple of these screenshots, but this is, as Greg said, setting the scene. So um, we're talking about vertical in this instance. Um, so this is directly underneath the boat with our traditional sonar on the left and our structure downscan on the right. So these are essentially golden perch that are in a little bit of a cluster and my lure descending. So reading the screen, if it's big enough for you, you can clearly see that that is what's happening. So we'll move through a, a few more of these screenshots and um, again, down scan, you've got a nice big cod sitting down just below um, or just alongside that rock at the bottom of the screen and you've got a big school of redfin perch. So when we go around sounding, side scan, down scan, whatever, we're looking for that bait ball, particularly in spring when all those reddies and bait fish have just schooled up depending on where you are. And then when you find that bait source, you imitate that to the best of your ability. And that's what we're doing is showing you what we're looking for. And then we'll go into the lures and stuff a little bit later when you guys have, girls have questions. But if we roll on to the next one now, Greg. Um, here, a bit of a mixture of the two there. So basically we've got some golden perch down in the V close to the middle of the screen. Um, and then you've got weed and a couple sticks um, on the far left-hand side of both those screenshots. On the bluer one and the darker black background, you can see there's some more highlights. Um, those more vertical highlights are a harder return. So that is a couple trees that are sitting in that water column there. And then, yeah, that's just a mixture of when fish meet cracks in the bottom. They usually like to sit where there's a bit of variation as well. So mm. couple that with a bit of weed and a little bit of structure in the forms of trees, that is a perfect hunting ground for our native fish, cod, yellow belly. And eyes are on the top of their head. They love sitting close to the bottom and hiding in that stuff. Good stuff. Um, and here we go. So this is the side scan. So you've got the side scan down the bottom. And then you've got the split of both sonars at the top. So you, you structure down scan in your traditional 2D. And what we're looking at here is um, a couple of fish that are just hiding in that little um, depression. And um, you'll be able to reference 
between all these screenshots here or this particular screenshot and the three screens that you've got a rock which is um, down underneath those fish on the top two splits and then you can actually see that on the side scan there. You can see that bit of shadow. So that rock is just a wee bit off the bottom. So essentially with your side scan, what we're looking for and what is your friend is shadow. So whether you see um, a really tall shadow, um, that generally means something is risen off the bottom and um, if it's not casting much of a shadow or no shadow at all, it's on the bottom itself. Um, if we're looking at the centre line there, that's the boat, um, and out towards the sides there where that darker water is, um, you, that's essentially what's underneath the boat. Um, and then from there you've got the contours which are coming up. So that's scanning out to the side as much as you choose to do so. Um, and essentially... The harder returns, again, are going to be something that is um, like a rock. Fish are quite um, uh, easy to pick up to the trained eye. They come up as a really hot, um, sharp highlight. Depending on the size of the fish and the angle that you scan them, though, um, they can show up to be um, a little dot, um, a little rice grain, so a little bit of angle. And then you've got your football blobs as well. And when you get a really good scan, and especially if you're using your 3D um, structure stuff, um, you can get a really, really good um, image of the fish as well. And um, when you're looking at fish too that are high up in the water column, you will often see um, a little spot, so a shadow away from that fish. It could be, if we're looking in reference to the actual screenshot, a centimetre or two away from it. Um, but the same thing is when you're shining a torch at something at night time, you have that silhouette. So if you're looking at a light pole, same sort of thing. So shadows are your big, big friend when you're talking about interpreting. And we're going to talk about more about that stuff as we go along. Mm. Now, we're in feet or in metres there, uh, Raymond? The question's come uh, through. We're, we're in Australia, mate, so we're using metres. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you're a young man, so that makes sense. So all good. All right, let's move on to the next screenshot, shall we? So similar to one of the previous screenshots, you've got a depression, so a little V um, coupled with a bit of structure. In this term, it's a really thick wheat bed. But you've got quite a big drop and a big rise, and um, that's the stuff I'm looking for when I'm sounding. Whether that's on the side scan, um, you're going to find on the side scan uh, that you're going to have quite a bit of shadow when you come up to a rock of that height out to the side. But when we're vertical, we're looking for that big drop. We're looking for that bit of structure. And obviously, um, you can see there with um, the indications that we have a couple of fish sitting high up there. They're your golden perch or your larger red fin. Um, and the really big bonus with the Lowrance sounders is all the current models have fish reveal. And what fish reveal is, is essentially highlighting um, the bigger arches on the 2D, so the more colourful side that you've got there, and they're overlaying it essentially onto the um, structure scan so it pops out. And that's a really good feature for people coming into fishing um, because you can more easily distinguish those fish that are hiding, and this is a good example of that. You look on the left and... You, and to the untrained eye, it's very hard to spot a fish within all that cluster. It's very dense, but you can look straight away on the right-hand side there. Uh, you've got those highlights that just pop out. So bear that in mind if you're looking to buy a new sounder and you're just getting into the sounding game and interpreting fish. And, Roman, one of the things, and this has come up over and over during these sonar masterclasses, I remember when I first started using um, sonar, you know, it, it was the case that you had to set the sonar up and then play around with it and tweak it. And, you know, these days you pull it out of the box, you put it on auto, and it's pretty damn good straight out of the box, isn't it? Exactly. It's great. Um, with with shallow water fishing, and that's what I do, um, freshwater fishing in all essence is shallow water. Um, and when I say shallow water, I'm talking 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 metres, that sort of stuff. That is shallow in the granite um, scheme of things. So I really don't adjust my settings too much. Leave it on auto. I may up and down the contrast, adjust the um, surface clarity if there's a lot of clutter in the water. But it's really minute changes, and that's, that's, that's the bonus with our form of fishing. You're not fishing that really deep stuff as you would be if you're going out on the coast, on the reefs, you know, that deeper water. Um, so there's not too much of um, 
adjusting that you need to do. And that's a fantastic thing about technology across the board these days for sounders. Yep, yep, absolutely. Now, um, mate, we've got a question from Cameron. He's asking on that um, structure scan, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Cameron, I think this is what you're asking. On the structure scan there on the left and right of the weed, you can see some uh, colour there. Is that just hard bottom showing up there, mate? Yeah, so if we're talking about the left-hand side, um, so the more colourful screenshot, the um, the yellow is more your hard compacted bottom. So whether that be rock, compacted sand, stuff of that nature, um, or hard um, a hard mud like dried up, not dried up, but you get what I'm saying, that compacted mm. stuff, that's what that return is. So um, when you're looking at that weed, it doesn't have that texture or that colour because it's not that hard structure. Mm. And on the right-hand side there on the structure scan, you can see just a, a thin yellow line there on the surface. That's just the, the hard bottom coming up again in structure scan, I assume. Uh, it's very hard for me to see that from here. But, yeah, so essentially that that sometimes um, will be the case. Um, generally, when we get to a couple other screenshots where you, um, if we get time, because we've got so many here, um, there is a couple from memory that have a fish sitting on the bottom and that's more okay. easy to distinguish what a fish is. But generally if it's that thin and it's on that contour, it can be the bottom itself. Okay, cool. All right, let's move on. I think we're now into your brag shots, mate. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> right, we're already into there. That's cool. Um, well, this is a, simply a cod, Murray cod, casting against the bank. So we talked a lot about um, vertical fishing um, in the last podcast. So um, this is traditionally casting the bank. So when we're going out scanning, um, I'm also looking up the bank. Um, so a happy medium, what I like to do when I'm scanning is generally if I'm scanning, let's just say 10 metres of water, I'm usually wanting to um, have my side scan set to about 20, sometimes 30, so more just double or a little bit more um, just to get that clearer shot. Um, and I'm searching for those fish that are sitting up on the bank as this fish was in this particular instance. This fish was sitting in quite shallow water. Um, mm. Out of the water, it was a bit rocky, um, so it appeared to have the rock wall there, but because of the water level, it was actually quite shallow and weedy. And um, I did not spot this fish, so I'm not going to claim that I did, but these are the scenarios that I'm looking for these fish. So whether that's one metre of water, five, ten metres of water, right up against the bank or a few metres off the bank, I'm using my side scan to locate either that fish or the structure that it may be sitting beside. Because if you have a big um, bit of structure with a high shadow, you're not necessarily going to see what's on the other side of that because you're not you're the ping, so um, the sounder itself sending the signal to the bottom or whatever it's hitting and coming back is not going to be able to get around that corner. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it, we'll get into that a bit more when we see those screenshots, but that's a, a fish caught just casting the bank with a Rapala x ray pedo, so just a swim bait style of lure, and that was last season. Yep, all right. Now we've got a bunch of, of um, brag shots here. Do you want to just go through those and then we'll move on to the screenshots of, uh, of Sonar? Or do you want oh, to move on sure. to screenshots? Um, yeah. So this, this particular fish um, was one of the fish that I caught um, during this spring when it was a really tough bite. I was utilising my side scan. I was actually going through really spindly trees um, and the fish reveal was a real big bonus for me because sometimes it can be quite difficult to pick up fish on the side scan. Like I said, when you have a lot of um, clutter in the water and, of course, it does affect the range that you're, you're actually um, uh, uh, sounding to the side. The, the 455 frequency, for example, is what I usually run for my side scan. Um, that gets you quite a wide array of um, distance, both sides of the boat. Um, but in this instance, I did actually change that to um, the, uh, the, the, the higher frequency. The higher frequencies generally will actually create more separation um, with the fish to the structure and be a little bit easier to see. But the big thing is you just have to bear in mind that if you do go to that um, setting or that um, the higher um, hertz, you're going to lose quite a bit when you're trying to do a big scan. So let's just say you fish are really quiet like it was in this instance. Um, doing a big scan, you're going to be missing quite a lot. So in this instance, I just projected a little bit further um, with a smaller cone, got a bit more separation, was able to distinguish these fish sitting 
on this spindly stuff. Um, and then I had my Lowrance live site, which is live sonar technology. We may have a video here to show you um, of stopping on these fish and then being able to adjust my retrieve and uh, throw down several different lures, which I did to get them going. So when your golden perch, yellow belly, callop, whatever you call them, um, when they're a bit finicky, having all this sonar technology is fantastic for spotting them, but it's another thing catching them. But having that ability to side scan them, down scan them, adjusting your frequencies just a little bit, like I said, fresh water, don't need to do too much. Then dropping down your live sonar, it all works well to give you that best chance of catching the fish. Not going to guarantee you fish, but that's what I did with this fish. And you'll see a little video of another fish from this school um, using that method of live sonar. Mm. Um, this was a uh, quite a big fish, actually. This was 64 centimetres, um, only caught a couple of months ago during the springtime. Um, this was working a blade off the bottom in a really shallow um, corner of a bay. And um, I was utilising my um, side scan to actually um, project out sideways and not spook the fish that are in the shallow water. So another um, perfect example of side scanning effectively is in the real shallow stuff. Um, this instance, there wasn't too much weed because the water's come up, so I had a pretty clear view. And being able to um, find where these fish are sitting um, is the big key. So that fish was simply working a blade real close to the bottom um, and just side scanning in that bay to find the fish that are sitting hard against the bottom. Um, well, this, this, this is a fish that I caught a couple of years back, actually. This is a, um, a quite a monster golden perch. Um, it only was 65, and I'm only saying only 65 because it weighed um, about 9 kilos. So it was an absolute horse of a fish. So you can see the shoulders in that fish. This one was simply tracking down um, to the far reaches of the dam um, and having my, my traditional sonar just um, and my structure down scan going. Um, at this time, I wasn't side scanning. I knew that I was going through a corridor where I marked some trees. So a, a good little tip is if you see a bit of structure, mark it. Whether that has a fish on it or not, just mark it because often in a dam where it's quite sparse um, or scarce, sorry, um, of structure being around, finding that one little rock hump, that one little tree, um, that one little stick or lay down can often mean that you will come back and find fish hovering around that. Um, so that particular fish there, I was doing just that traveling, spotted a fish on the sounder, dropped it straight down, bang, caught the fish and um, yeah, glad that I stopped. And when you see fish like that and you get that little inkling, do stop. If you've got spot lock, engage it, give it a go and then look, you might pull up something of that quality. Hmm. So Shane's asking a question, mate. Side scanning in shallow water, how shallow can it be effective? Uh, I, I, even when I'm vertically talk, fishing, um, I'm talking a metre or two, same thing with side scan. Enough water to cover their back. Obviously, in the shallows, the super shallow, you're going to generally have some growth, whether that's weed or some grass or something of that nature. So that can then make it difficult um, to find the fish on the side scan um, when it's all clustered up like that. But it all depends on the environment that you're fishing. But essentially, you can side scan in very shallow water and be quite effective. Hmm. All right, we'll go back, give a couple more of your screenshots, a couple more of your brag shots, mate. Uh, that was a uh, fish that was uh, three well, three seasons ago, I think it was, but again, casting. Actually, no, that was um, the fish that I caught just the week before the big cod that you saw previously. So that was a couple of years ago, casting the Rapal x Rapetto again, just scanning the banks, um, locating the fish and just casting the edges. And what I like to do is stick away from the fish when I'm casting the banks. Um, a lot of people cast directly into the bank. I like to sit parallel. Um, so if I do a scan of a bank, I'm usually scanning 10 metres minimum away from the bank. Sometimes I go a little bit further. I want to get that detail though, so I generally just sneak up with my electric. And you're scanning fish that are sitting up on the bank, especially in winter time when it's cold and they sit on the bank for a little bit longer. But in summer, morning and evening time, doing the same thing. Um, yes, yeah, so that's pretty much just a carbon copy of what I was doing previously. Um, so once we get into the screenshots, you'll, be, you'll get a bit more substance of what I'm talking about. That's that big 65 that you see um, <laughs> in the previous shot as well, so just a different view. Um, vertical fishing, as you can see, the Rapala rip and wrap there. 
All right, one of some screenshots. We've also got a question from Ben, so I might just zap over and we'll have a talk to that first. So Ben's question, mate, is about tackle. What's your favourite bait caster and what size braid and leader do you use? Well, up until about six months or six to nine months ago, I wasn't using these reels, but I can tell you what, they're really good. Um, and I'll try not to break rods here. but um, you put your rod through the fan things. or anything like that? No, no, no <laughs> fan in that. Um, so these are uh, the 13 Fishing series of Baycaster reels, and these are just ridiculously awesome. And I use ridiculously awesome because I, I first time I took these out was when it was blowing an absolute gale, and it's on my Roaming Productions Australia page on Facebook, and I'm absolutely punching casts in the wind the first time I used them. Didn't even need to adjust them, and the distance I was getting casting these was just phenomenal, and just the smoothness of the reel and the drag pressure as well. Um, I think this one's got 25-pound drag, and it's quite a small profile bait caster, and it's just silky smooth. So that coupled with the castability, um, it's just perfect for targeting big cod, having that drag pressure and um, just that smoothness to even fish with the heavier braid and get that feel as well. It's Reels do have an impact as well. It's not just the rod and it's not just the line. The reel itself can give you a bit of extra feel and can make the difference. There you go, Ben. So there's a couple of things to um, put on your Christmas list, mate. Just around the corner, you might score a couple of reels if you're lucky. So, all right, let's have a look at some screenshots, Roman. So first off the rank, tell us all, all right. about this particular shot. All right, so whether you're fishing for yellow belly or cod, um, this is what you're actually looking for. Um, so this is a perfect example of what I was talking about before, having just that little bit on the bottom. So this was quite a flat bottom up until we got to this little bit of rock. There's a little bit of a rock rise in the middle of the screen there, and you've got a native fish just hugging right up on the bottom. Um, and we are in a little bit of depth, so we're about their 10-metre range. So... When you're talking about the size of fish in relation to depth, usually um, when you're in the deeper water and you've got a substantial looking arch or a thicker blob on the um, uh, structure down scan, it usually indicates a bigger fish. So if that size um, arch was sitting a bit shallow, it would be a smaller fish. But because it's that size at that depth, we know it's quite a large fish. So this is either um, a, a decent sized cod or a nice yellow belly and the yellow belly and gugong are just so fat you can often confuse them for cod but that bit of structure is perfect when you see that on your side scan or you see that on your down scan that's the stuff i'm talking about marking it and always coming back to it but when you've got that coupled with a little bit of a redfin school just sitting out on the right hand side there and a couple more scattered fish just towards the center and a bit higher that's your perfect ambush point but that bit of structure on the bottom is what keeping the native fish there and when you have a stable dam it's really good just to continuously go over these spots because what you'll find is fish will will move a lot but they often will return to a particular area so if we think of it like a football field right about 100 meters wide uh, long um, and what 50 meters wide whatever it is those fish are going to be patrolling around that area they're not going to just focus on the one thing so be mindful of that if they're not there now, they could easily be there later and just map it out every time you go out, find a good snag, eventually you'll find fish there and at the right water depth you can absolutely brain them um, and keep coming back. And it's it's quite it's it's quite strange how fish can just refresh. So when, when people are catching trout, for example, and they're casting up the streams like I used to do a lot in the Brindabellas, um, th those rapids used to reset quite quickly um, after you would catch a fish. Um, I find the same thing when we're talking about native fish, so cod and yellow belly, um, especially in storages where they do a lot of moving and um, they don't hold a snag like they would so in a river like the Murray or that sort of thing. Mm. Um, you've got all these little nuances and um, that you can get a lot from just one screenshot. So that's just a little example of um, how I think about it when I'm going out there just identifying those spots that I want to fish. Yeah, yeah. All right, mate, a couple more questions coming through, so let's just address a couple of those. So Chris is asking about boat speed when you're using your sonar. So boat speed, um, in Canberra, luckily, I mean, luckily or unluckily, um, depending how you're looking at it, it's electric only. So the dams that I fish most of the time are electric only, so I'm, I'm just 
putting along with my electric. When I say putting along, I've got a 10 horsepower Torquedo. So when I'm traveling, I'm traveling about seven and a half kilometers an hour. Um, that's not my max speed, but that's the speed that I like to go, one, to conserve battery, but for two, um, to get clarity on the sound. And so it really just depends on if it's um, petrol motor, how much turbulence you're getting from your actual um, petrol, if you're using your petrol to do scanning. Um, and I'm going to get into a little bit more about um, a little bit of disturbance in the water when you're talking about scanning in general later on. But usually seven and a half kilometres would probably equate to a good um, – uh, scanning speed in petrol if you're just putting along just to get that clarity. It varies a little bit depending on your boat hull and configuration, all that sort of stuff yeah. as well. So yeah. there's a lot to it. So question from <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna lose my voice here. Question from Mark, mate. So colour line preference for fish reveal overlay and other colours. Well, what you're, what you're seeing there is exactly what I like to use. Um, everyone's going to have a different view on what's going to be easiest for them, but the traditional colour of the 2D sonar on the left, I find that the easiest, whether that's the traditional sonar or the live sight transducer, I find that's the easiest to interpret with the contrast, the white back, obviously the um, you know the deep oranges and the, the blues and that sort of stuff. When you're talking about structured down scan and your side scan, I really like the blue palette from memory. I think it's number nine, um, but it's yeah. I find that's the easiest, especially for people that come into the game. Um, I do some sounder tutorials as well on people's boats, and when I take them out, um, if they have got a color scheme on their branded sounder, I, I like to stick with that because I find that it's a little bit easier to distinguish those highlights, especially in the waterways I fish, where it can be quite difficult. I can't hear you, Greg, so I don't know if that's from my end or your end. Thank you. It's because I muted my microphone to cough and forgot to turn it back on again. So Eric's um, saying that he knows that spot, mate, and he always gets yellows and reds there. So uh, th there you go. Um, got a question from Brad Passfield. G'day, Brad. How are you going, mate? Brad's one of my Team Doc Lures members. So Brad's saying, are there times when you'd use vertical over side scan and can side scan contradict the information when you're trying to read the down scan or vice versa? Um, look, I used to only go down scan until oh, close-ish to a year ago. Um, I now run a split of your structure down scan and your sonar and then at the bottom having that wider um, side scan option, um, especially when I'm traveling. Um, I find that's the best, obviously, being able to search out quite wide and also focus on what's happening underneath me. Um, not as much as you think in terms of um, not picking up something on the down scan versus the side scan. I thought there would be a little bit more when I got into that, but it is actually quite good, I would say. Um, at least 80% would be what I'm seeing on my side scan when it's quite close to the down scan beam I'm actually seeing. It might be that I'm seeing it on a slightly different angle, so it doesn't look like a mirror image, but the location is what's going to give it to me. And the beautiful thing is you can go and hit your cursor on the side scan um, and it will relay um, down onto the down scan too. So if it's quite close to under the boat, you can locate that fish quite easily. Um, and again, if you find that um, fish on the side scan, which is way outside the beam, you just go hit your cursor, go to it, save the waypoint, and there you have it. You'll be able to find what's out there too. So... Yeah, it's quite good in, in short. Um, not perfect, but up there in percentages. Get, get, getting better all the time as well. Exactly. Question from John. I wonder when you were going to uh, pipe up and say your piece, John. So John's asking what your preferred braid is for the bait caster, mate, and if you found one that's equally good on a spin reel, if you happen to use a spin reel as well. Yeah, so um, braid-wise, I use Suffolk's A32 when it comes to my really coarse cod fishing braid. Saying that, though, I was using that exclusively um, over the last five or six years anyway for my light stuff. So let's just talk about uh, vertically working um, soft plastics up and down the tree line. Um, you get line twists like you do with any braid, um, but recently what I've done for um, fishing that really finesse stuff, whether that's six pound, fishing those blades on the bottom or working plastics up and down the tree, that sort of stuff, I've been going to Suffolk 131 braid and that's just another league of braid. It's just ridiculous how how awesome that braid is. It's um 
it, it's quite pricey, but it's well worth it because it's it's a round braid um, and it's super, super, super thin. Like I'm talking the 20 pound um, looks and feels like um, eight and six pound of some other braids that I've used. Um, but it's silky smooth, barely any line twist when you're talking about working those plastics up and down the tree um, and the longevity with Suffolk line in general but particularly those two types is what I use. And um, the fraying, they barely fray, and that's awesome when you're targeting that big structure, casting spin baits and all that stuff with the big cod. So, um, yeah, that's in a nutshell, that's what I use. And colour-wise, I used to be the whole, oh, the fish are going to see the fluoro colour, but I've come to learn with all the finesse stuff that I'm doing and the technology that we have, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. Um, I like to use the fluoro stuff so I can see my line hitting the bottom when I'm vertical fishing, that's the whole point. My lures being on the bottom, being able to easily distinguish when it hits the bottom, counting how long it's on the bottom for, or when I'm casting my swim baits, that sort of stuff as well, seeing how far in the water column I am. Um, so, yeah, that, that's it. Sorry, long and short, but I love that braid, and, yeah, it's hard for me to get off it. Long is what John likes, and John and I have had a couple of discussions via email about braids recently, so I'm sure there'll be a little bit more to follow after that little rundown. So thanks for that, mate. Um, a question from Jeffrey, and I think it may have been then uh, replied to by somebody. Where are we? I oh, know. So uh, he's asking what black lines on the sounder mean, and then he's clarified when he's on side scan. A side scam, I, I assume, not side scam, because some of us here might have a side scam. But um, hopefully that's not what we're talking about. So black, what line. black lines on the side scan, man. Jeffrey, if you've got a, an image, if you've got a, a screenshot of that, you should be able to um, post that to us in the in the chat here. Um, and that might help us to figure out. I think, what I, think yeah, I think I know what he might be talking about. Um, he said structure scan, correct? Uh, no, he said okay, side, cool. side, side scan. scan. Okay, black lines. I haven't really seen too many black lines. Um, usually if I find a problem or if I find something that's a bit strange that I haven't seen before, I usually just YouTube it um, because it's like those things. There's so many things that can show up on a sound and there's so many nuances in settings. You're not always going to remember things unless it happens, so I can't really tell you without seeing it. Um, I have to replicate it myself to really get a full understanding of it. The other thing you could try as well, Jeffrey, is just take a screenshot and post it on the Lawrence. Facebook page and ask the Lawrence guys. They may have seen it before. They've seen a couple of things in, in their time over the years, I'm sure. Um, maybe someone there can help you out as well. So uh, John's very happy with his answer about the braid. So thank you for that, Roman. Answer the next question as well because he's just about uh -huh. to spill up his tranks. So good stuff. All right, mate, let's move on to another screenshot and have a look at what we've got here. Okay, so we're in a little bit shallower. So before I was talking about deep water, the 10 metre range, how fish appear a little bit smaller, but in fact, they're quite bigger. So when we're looking at the shallower stuff, so two to five metres, two to six metres, stuff of that nature, um, you really got to think about what these fish might be. Um, I know that these fish are golden perch, um, quite big, big returns. And the one on the far right, you could even mistake for a cod depending on the storage as you're fishing and the nature of how big those fish are too, they're really big goldens that are there. That one on the right is quite a substantial fish. So um, they're goldens, me scanning the bank. And this was me vertical because this is, um, from memory, this one's from this spring. Um, I'm, I done my side scanning, couldn't really see too much um, because as I said, water was coming in it was really cluttered the fish weren't there as well i found out when i moved closer to the bank that was sitting a little bit in deeper water so another tip is when you do find your fish um, do focus on a particular depth of water because what you'll find generally especially when the fish are on that they're all going to be hovering around the similar sort of depth so if you're going to do away with side scan and focus on down scan you you can do that quite effectively once you work out where those fish are, and that's exactly what I was doing in this instance. I found them. I stuck with down scan, trying to get those detailed um, uh, images of those fish to try and work them out because they were really tough at that stage. Mm, yep, excellent. And Thomas Pinter, g'day, Thomas. Uh, good to have you here, mate. Thomas says the images are excellent, mate, and I tend to agree. It's almost as though Roman's done this before, I'd have to say. So Thanks, another, question, another question coming through here. 
um, from uh, from Mark Byrne. He's asking what the black, not so strong arches in the middle of the water column are on downscan. Okay. Uh, um, he's probably on the one. previous one. Let me bring that back up. Okay. So um, when you're talking black, I assume you're looking at the left hand side. So um, they can be fish moving in and out um, as well. So in this case, if they were fish, they would be um, a smaller fish, um, whether that's a redfin that was moving through. Um, but also those lines can be indicative of your lure as well. So if you're um, casting across the bank um, and then reeling it back in, uh, you'll see that your line across the bottom um, will be tracking along as well. So you'll see in some of my screenshots zigzags as well. Um, and that's purely my lure bouncing up and down. So it can be a couple things or a few things, but in this instance, I dare say that this is my actual lure moving through as I'm casting. Okay, cool. A uh, question from Shane. Uh, he's asking, uh, what tips do you, oh, hang on, sorry, I'm one question ahead of myself. With side scan, do you deduct the depth from the side meters, i.e. 20 meters, actually 15 meters in five meters of water? So... Let me go back to a side yeah, scan. No, 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 that's right. okay. It's all good. I think I've got a, a good sense of what he's talking about. Um, so if we're looking at the side scan image when it comes up here at the bottom of the screen, so the center line is essentially at the boat. So um, I'm counting from that point onwards, um, uh, and that's how I identify. That's how I identify my fish. Like like I said, I usually go over to a fish. So you can see that rock that's um, on that side scan there. That's quite a bit away. Um, that's when I'll move on in, but I count it from the center line. Okay, cool. Another question comes through from George. Do you, do you have any tips, mate, for differentiating between yellow belly, cod, and carp on traditional sonar? Yeah, so um, carp are quite easy to pick up after you've seen them a lot. Um, so generally what carp do, they're, they're a bit of a schooling fish, They um, and they're constantly moving when they're up in the water column especially. Um, so what you're going to see is a lot of thin lines like a kid's drawing with a crayon essentially, and they're coming up and down and around, deep, shallow, they're just doing everything. Um, so when you have a cluster of fish or even a few fish doing that, Constant movement, most likely going to be a carp, especially in a carp-infested waterway. Gugong, no carp, fantastic. It's either cod, yellow belly, or your large redfin. But, yeah, that's essentially what the carp look like. Um, when you're talking native fish, so let's just talk about the bigger ones, so bigger golden perch and bigger cod, um, or medium cod, they're still big. Um, you're going to see um, quite a long, let's just use the boomerang, Example, if you've got a fish directly under the boat and you're moving across it, it's going to show up as a boomerang. If it's quite a thick boomerang, um, you, so as you can see there on the right-hand side, um, that is a bigger fish. So if it's a bit thicker, it's generally going to be your native fish. Um, and they're quite dormant, so they're not moving a lot. Um, so you're going to get a, a better um, image of those fish, whether that's the shape of the fish or whether that's the... Um, the, the actual definition of how thick that fish is, they're going to be quite stationary most of the time. So that's the big thing. Carp move, they're more squiggly. Um, your natives are more staying there, solid, stubborn things, um, lazy to a point. Um, that's the big differences between the two. Okay, cool. Now, John's back with another question about reels, mate. So in the 13 fishing range, what mate... Uh, I think it's supposed to be what make, what model size are you using for lobbing the really big swim baits? Because, of course, between brands, the size is varied a bit. But in Shimano speak, you're using a 200, 300, or 400 size bait caster. I've, I've never looked at the size of the reels, to be honest. Um, they're all the same size. That's why, probably why. But um, when we're looking at it, um, so they're your standard um, the bait caster size when it comes to back in the day when I used the Shimano Cronarch. Um, that was essentially the size that we're looking at. Um, but the beautiful thing about this that these reels are is the beefed up drag. So um, you can get away casting the smaller ones on your bait caster gear, uh, sorry, on your swim bait gear because you've got that power in that drag system. Um, so I don't have the oversized ones at this stage. I've just got the normal ones and they're doing me just fine. Excellent. Thomas Pinter, do you ever change the color palette for different scenarios, e.g. dam river, side down or uh, side or down image, or do you just interpret certain colors best all around? Um, 
as I was mentioning before, I like to keep it on those two palettes that we are seeing. But saying that, when you have those really tough days or when you have those days where the water is just filthy, I do like to change it up a little bit. So um, on the structured down scan, I do change sometimes when I'm either just completely shot mentally and I just want to see something different. Um, I go to, there's like a hot red colour, um, which is similar, I guess, in terms of this traditional sonar, but the background's more of a red. Um, so, yeah, that's the other colour that I do like on the structure. Um, I do see that in your some of your screenshots you use that, like, um, light orange or brownie colour. I do sometimes use that as well, but 95, at least, percent of the time I stick with what I've got here. Is it really just personal preference, mate, or do the colour palettes I think, I, I think it's a mixture of that, but also um, the the density of um, the structure that you're actually fishing at. So, you know, I know Burundong and those other dams that I've mentioned have really big trees and Burundjuk's a good example. Burundjuk, it's a lot easier to go in and side scan and even down scan and see those football blobs, no matter what colour that you're really um, using, compared mm. to Gugong where it's... You know, you're not seeing as many fish out in open water um, and there's not that tr that really thick tree that's that spindly stuff and it can be hard to distinguish as well. Um, so it really just depends on preference and, I guess, the dam location as well. Okay, cool. So another question from Ben. He's asking about trout in Googong, right? Are there any left? Yes. Um, I've accidentally caught a few um, <laughs> and that's on cod and yellowbelly gear. Um they don't stock browns anymore. Browns are not good for the waterway at all. Um, they do still stock um, yearly some rainbows, um, but there are some really big bucknose browns that are continuously breeding, and um, I've had them follow my big swim baits and big spinner baits in, and they're like honkers. They're like big bucknose, huge things that scare you. You just look at it and go, what the hell is that? It's not a cod, but put two and two together, it's a trout. Um, plenty of people go out there and um, particularly in the war the cooler months and um, just around even the banks of Google and they walk and they cast their flies and they do catch fish. So I've heard of multiple um, browns even being caught and a fair few rainbows over the last six months. All righty. Let's have another screen. Actually, we've got another question coming through from Eric. He's got a Corrado DC. What do you think of them? Um, digital control. I assume. Um, I had a Corrado um, back when they weren't digital control and I found it pretty good. So I assume digital control, new technology, will be better than that. So if it yeah. means anything to you, Eric, I've just ordered two of them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's have a look at another screenshot, mate, because uh, we've got a few to get through still. So onto the side scan here. Okay, cool. So this was similar. Have you to seen this one before or is this a repeat? Yeah, it's a repeat, um, but you leave it here. It's a good okay. example. Um, my screen's a little bit cluttered, but um, looking at this side scan, um, so you can see on the far right-hand side, um, you can see how the water is actually getting shallower. So you've got that really crisp, hard return, so that white. And on the left-hand side, you've got that darker bit of water um, or bottom, I should say. And then you've got those two lines which are just left of that black in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the big things for that is going into deeper water. So that can also cause that water or that image to be darker. Um, but you see those um, two lines there. That's an indication of um, a change in depth. So um, there's quite a substantial little bit of a dip and a rise there. Um, so when we're looking at spots that fish might be hiding in, um, that's the sort of stuff that I'm talking about as well. Um, if that's quite high, it can be hard to see fish within that shadow mark, but that's a good example of slightly deeper water on your left and then that harder return, either harder bottom, shallower water mix on your right-hand side. And then obviously you've got a rock on the right-hand side, approximately halfway across, um, that's a rock with a shadow, so you can automatically see that there is a shadow behind there, so that rock is risen off the bottom a little bit. And then you've got some rocks below that which are quite granular. They're, they're hard up against the bottom, so you can make them out in texture, but they're not substantially tall. 
Excellent. All right. Got another question come through, and it's a really good one. So I'm going to just do away with the screenshots for a moment. Uh, from Brad Passfield, and he's asking, he's got a Lowrance HDS Gen 2, which works perfectly fine, but how often should I update my sounder to keep up with technology if money's no object? Yeah, well, the big thing to what, what I say with people, especially when they buy a sounder, always update it even from out of the box because that could have been packaged six months ago, could have been packaged a year ago, and updates happen quite frequently, so between three and six months generally. So um, always search for those updates on the Lowrance website for the older units as well that don't have that Wi-Fi capability. Um, and, yeah, just update it every time because one of the big things with sounders is um, no matter what brand you're talking about, a lot of sounders will get sent back to the manufacturer as a problem. Um, and I know for a fact that a lot of the times um, these sounders haven't been updated. And just like with your phones and stuff, there's constant automatic updates that happen often when you're sleeping, you don't know about it, um, they're going to fix those bugs. So especially with the newer te like technology we have at the moment, this live capability, all the awesome sounder equipment, um, there's a lot in it. So you want to make sure you update it. Always search between three and six months if you don't have that Wi-Fi capability that the new ones do where you can just drive into your garage, turn your sounder on, connect it to your Wi-Fi, bang, automatically will update and tell you that there's one there. Um, three to six months. Hmm. I, I'm going to get you to expand on that because I actually interpreted that question differently. I interpreted how often do I update my hardware? Oh, sorry. So, actually, we've got actually got a clarification from Brad coming through now. That's what he's asking as well. So how often would you update the entire sounder as opposed to the software? Um, depends how much money I've got in my pocket. <laughs> um, that's a Brad's that's got a it. Brad's but, got it. Um, but – I guess it depends on you and what you do for your fishing. Um, if you're someone who's just happy to go out and see the depth, um, interpret what a fish is, not get too technical, especially with these newer sounders where you've got the capability of all this networking, connecting to your iPad, controlling stuff through your phone, all this this sort of stuff, um, it really is dependent on you. But, um, I mean, I stick up to date as much as I can and, when I can afford it because I like to go the next level and the fishing's all about evolving, whether that's lures, whether that's electronics, the fish are going to catch on at some point with what you're doing. Why not just get the most recent thing if you're really that into your fishing and you get that enjoyment out of it? So it really just depends on who you are and your budget and where you want to see yourself as a fish fisherman, especially if you're a lure fisherman. Yeah, good stuff. So we had a question come through from Matt about how he can watch this Masterclass again, Matt, you can watch it again on YouTube. You can watch it again on Facebook. It's also on the doclures.com website <laughs> over there. You'll be able to watch that in the previous one. So Roman did one previously as well on vertical fishing for cod. So you might find that useful too. Speaking of vertical fishing, uh, we've got Adam asking, mate, are you looking forward to using Active Target for your vertical fishing? Uh, what's Active Target? I'm assuming... It's the new technology. I cannot confirm or deny any new technology. <laughs> Don't know anything about it. No. All good. Um, what have we got now? Mark Byrne, one more question, mate. Mark, keep asking questions, mate. We love questions. So we're usually finding cod in water depth of six metres. What range should I run the side scan out to? Uh, also uses 13 rods and reels, by the way. <laughs> that I do as well. Um, <laughs> so six metres, you said? Six metres, yes. Yeah, so generally I go two to three times, as I mentioned before. So, um, again, if you're fishing shallow and it really is dependent on what's happening, if the fish are quite concentrated and you know what depth they're in, then you can afford to go a little bit um, narrower in your search. So, for mm. example, if I'm... Um, side scanning the trees if i'm trying to find some yellow belly sitting on the trees or find a big cod sitting on a stump and that sort of stuff um if i know those fish and i've already identified they're in that particular six meter range i'm only going to be side scanning 10 meters because i want to see that detail i want to see that separation and again it comes down to the waterway and how clear it is in terms of the image coming back to you and i often do change my um my side scan to just show the right hand side on my screen so you can either see left to the right or you can just see left 
and you can just see right, oh, we're getting to the stage where the fish are there. They're not that spooky. They may be hard to catch, but I know where they are, so I really want to identify exactly where they are. So then I'll just, um, you know, five metres out, ten metres out, Sometimes I'll just go three metres out because I really want to see what's happening in relation to my down scan and my side scan and work together because sometimes you do have to work together just to get that complete picture. Very good. All right. Look, I think the questions have slowed down enough that we can have a breather, mate. We'll bang up another one of your screenshots. Let's just do it in a way that we can all see it. Perfect. All right. So in, in this screenshot, again, you've got your side scan. So what you're seeing here is... Um, Looking at the top two splits, um, you've got a fish, so that little bit of an arch there, mid-water, sitting just off a tree. Um, and you can see that tree on the side scan there quite clearly on the right-hand side. Um, and what I'll, what I'll get into as well is um, coming back to sound of placement as well, um, I did mention that sometimes you can get um, uh, a little bit of a more grainier read and deeper colour read. Um, on one side of your sounder, but it also does come down to your sounder placement too. So my boat is notorious for being really finicky for getting an absolute 100% crisp picture on both sides because it's got very, um, it's got heaps of little um, like uh, drops in the hull um, and it's really hard for me to get that smooth water on both sides of that um, actual uh, transducer. But coupling that as well, I'm travelling with my transom and I've got some bubbles um, and disturbance created from that. So you can see um, less of a detailed return and a little bit more clutter in the black part of the um, side scan um, because you're not getting that clear view on the other side of the boat. So you also have to take that into, um, into consideration and there is a little bit of that on the left-hand side. But one thing I didn't touch on earlier was you got your centre line and then you've also got um, a mirror image on either side. So when you get that mirror image on either side, um, essentially you're just going straight over the top of that particular um, bit of structure. Let's use that as an example for this tree. You can see it quite defined on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, it's a little bit more grainy and more blobby. Um, that, fit, that, that tree itself is a little bit further to the right-hand side of the hull of the boat and, again, mixed in with where that transducer is um, positioned and how fast I'm travelling when I'm sounding. On to the next one. Okay. Um, so here we've got a fairly dull-looking bank. Um, you can see here on um, the the down scan at the top right-hand image, you've got a little bit of a weed bed that's just coming up on this little bit of a drop or rise, depending on which way you're going. Um, but you can see on the side scan here that you've also got more of that um, blobbiness, so weed bed growth on the far right-hand side. Um, so outside of that down scan beam, you can see that cluster, and it's going into a bit darker, which means that water is not as, um, well, it's getting a little bit deeper um, or the bottom's not quite that hard. But in this instance, the bottom wouldn't be quite as hard up against that bank. But you can see some highlights there as well. Um, so there is a, most likely a couple of fish sitting in there, but there's also a little bit more structure too. So that's the scenario where I can't see anything on my down scan within that structure scan, traditional 2D sonar or the fish reveal function. Um, so I'm going a bit wider, and I'll scan that again, but over the top of that actual wider beam of the bottom screen, of the bottom um, split, and that's what I'm talking about. You're going out identifying that structure, whatever it is. So you keep doing that, then you'll keep mapping out where those fish might likely return to or where they're sitting the other side of. Um, and that's, that's a real big key of side scanning. It's not just scanning and... Um, hoping that you're going to see something on your down scan at the same time. Mm. So question from Shane, is the tree five metres away? I'm not, does he, is that referring to this particular? I don't think he is. Um, I think he was talking about the previous one. Um, right. so, now, I've, right. now I've done it. There we go. Okay. Because we can see that um, actual tree in the down scan, it's actually within the beam. 
it's not on the edge. So for me, that is very close to that um, that width away of the boat into that um, bank that it comes up. So that's probably about your four meter range, um, maybe your three and a bit. All right. Onward and upward, mate. Okay, cool. So this is this is a perfect example of um, down scanning and finding a school of fish sitting around a very good likely bit of structure. So some people might go over this and go, oh, there's a heap of reddies there. I don't want to stop. I can only see reddies. But you've got um, these rocks here. There could be a native sitting on the other side that you can't actually see because you didn't get that complete scan. Um, and that's when your side scan will be very, very effective. Just go back over that spot with your side scan and then you'll be able to see a little bit more up on the other side of that. So um, that is an absolute perfect prime bit of um, native structure that you really need to try and hone in on if you see it. Okay, so here we've got, um, this is quite an old one, um, but you can see the split's a little bit different. Um, you've got an uh, instance where you've, you've almost got the mirror image of um, that tree or that bush that's there and it looks like it's split in the middle. So in this instance, what I've done is I've um, backed away. So I've seen this bit of structure, I've come back to it. And so I've got a double scan of it. So it does look quite symmetrical to a point, but when you see this sort of stuff, you've either um, stopped on an area and the ping's just coming back and back and back, or you've just moved off and come back. So um, doing this was, the, the reason for this was because I saw the bit of structure, so I doubled back. Um, so just bear in mind that when you get these readings of this nature, whether that's on your down scan or your side scan, you're just hitting it twice. It's not just a peculiar tree. Um, some people can get a little bit confused with that. Um, with the fish reveal, you can see there that there's a couple of fish that are hanging off that tree. Um, and again, perfect example of a tree that, or a bit of structure that you should focus on, especially when you're down, um, when you're vertically fishing, but also if you want to cast um, your bigger swim baits and spinner baits and stuff against, because you're looking at that depth, which is quite close to the bank still. Um, and many, many dams, for example, will have banks where you'll have quite a substantial drop just off the bank, um, but also you'll have banks which um, do come down quite on a slant and then once you get to a point, it does drop off. So that little drop is what I call a cod drop because I find that cod love to sit in that deeper water, be lazy, then move up. And this tree was not too far off that drop. So having that coupled with that change in water depth is just a perfect spot for you to focus on and continuously travel across and study what's happening on that bit of structure. Excellent. Let's just keep rattling through these. Remember to ask questions, guys, if you've got more questions. Meanwhile, we'll just keep going through these screenshots because they're awesome, mate. They are picture perfect, I have to say. Um. Yeah, sorry, I'm using my phone for this. Uh, I sh probably should have been using a computer, so I'm getting quite close to the screen. But um, with with um, with this one, again, um, a prime bit of structure. Um, you do have fish that are sitting up quite high on the far right-hand corner of the screen. So if you're looking at the structure down scan on the far right at the top, you've got that blob. And that blob is a fish that's sitting up quite high in the water column. And then if you look down on the structure side scan, you've got a, a faint blob um, that's sitting up um, on the probably the right-hand side of probably the last quarter of that screen, um, and that's that fish that's just sitting there. Um, and because it's a bit darker and it's a bit softer on that bank, it's quite hard to see the shadow, but you need to be able to understand what you're seeing on the side scan is generally going to appear what you're seeing on your down scan and vice versa depending on how far away that fish is from the, the beam of the boat um, when you're looking at your, your down scan. But that's just a perfect example. Again, you've got your hard rock, you've got a little bit of timber, um, and you've got your fish that are a little bit scattered. So, I've just got a question coming through from Brad here. I'm struggling with technology. but So Brad's asking, let me shut that down. Here we go. Fish facing direction, find any value in knowing what way the fish face? Is it possible to know? 
what way the fissure goes? Um, it is. Um, it is. It is quite difficult to. I mean, with the with the three D stru um, structure scan, that's a bit easier to tell. I'm only using the three in one transducer here, so I'm not getting that detailed image. But um, look, when particularly when I'm vertically fishing, it really doesn't matter um, because native fish don't tend to move a lot, so um, you're not going to really be um, putting the lure directly in front of them on the traditional um, 2D sonar side of things. When you're looking at your live capability stuff, that's when it's a lot easier because you can see them tracking and you can see them turning so you can put it on their nose. But in essence, you have to get a really good angle scan to see the shape of the fish. You can see the fins in some instances as well and then work out where that fish is sitting just from the actual um, image of that sounding itself. Hmm. Cool. All right. Let's go back to our screenshots. I think we used that one already. Done that one? Yep. How about that one? Okay, so this is the beautiful thing about having structured down scan. Um, you can see here on the left-hand side, you've got just a whole blob of mess, right? I kind of know what it is, but the average person will look at that and go, oh, that's a tree, it might be some weed. But have a look on your structured down scan, you can clearly see that you've got a very defined bit of tree hanging off the bottom. Um, and then you've got um, a little bit of weed hanging off just underneath that big blob on the right hand side of that. Um, so you've got a whole heap of information there. Um, and you know, with the top level sounders, or not even the top level these days, you can control your electric through your actual units, and that's what you're seeing on the left hand side there. So I'm anchoring and I'm moving with my HDS live and adjusting my um, my trolling motor in that aspect. But that's what you're seeing in this instance, and yeah, a perfect example of um, clarity with the structured down scan. But bearing in mind that I haven't adjusted anything, this is auto. And there's a bit of clutter, and that's what you're seeing at the top of this um, uh, water column here. Um, you're seeing the little blue fuzziness. That's a little bit of algae, a little bit of disturbance. Um, could even be your prop wash and that sort of stuff. And then you've got some um, floating debris further down, and then there's some fish mixed in with that, with those more um, uh, highlights there on the on the right hand side with the fish reveal. Hmm. Alrighty. Okay, so. What well, often what I hear from people, and especially back in the day when I first started, it was said to me that um, if it's connected to the bottom, it's a bit of structure. That's not the case, especially with the new technology where you can get a fair bit of separation. But this is on the auto setting, um, so the 455, so I haven't needed to get any separation because I can tell that this on the right-hand side is a cod. It's a cod holding the bottom. It looks like it's connected, but I can guarantee you it's not a, a log. It is a fish. And there's another fish to the left of that, which is a, more likely a golden perch at that depth. But this is a cod holding on the bottom. And I've mentioned previously, and I'll keep saying it, our Navy fish love the bottom. They will hold on the bottom. So it's really important to realise that when you see stuff like this, it's not necessarily all the time going to be a bit of stick on the bottom. Um, if you're not sure, drop your lure down, give it a go. But what you'll find a lot of the times is you'll sound this spot again and it won't be there. So <laughs> that's what I've done in this instance. This was a cod holding the bottom. That's the diagnostic tool, is it, mate? Logs don't swim. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what, what we can see here is this is a... This is a bit of an example. A googolong for is a hard dam to um, get a lot of uh, fish on, either the side scan or the down scan. They're, they're actually quite hard to spot. Um, they, Like I said, they like swimming around and they don't like to stand still when they're sulking. Um, they do it in cover. You just can't get to them. It's really strange. But if you're looking at this, this is just a plain... Um, bank, there's nothing special about it. But what I'm looking for in this instance are the bait schools where the fish might be congregating around. So you can see on the middle part of the right-hand side of this screen on the side scan, you've got those little dots, dot, 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 dot. They're your bait fish. So when I'm seeing that, that's when I'm going in and I'm um, having more of a look on what's on the other side. So that's just a general bare bone 
average looking bit of bottom that can hold a little bit of um, uh, gold if you just go a little bit beyond what you're seeing there. Literally and figuratively. Exactly. Um, so those lines that I was talking about before that can turn up on your sounder, um, you can see here um, on the structure down scan on your right hand side, that's my lure bouncing. Um, the fish reveal makes that pop out to more of a, um, a orange color, but that black line um, also, or that darker blue, sometimes it get, can get confused, can also be that lure. That's essentially my lure directly under the boat, jigging up and down. I'm just going to scroll up and um, I missed the bottom part there, but you've got fish that are moving on the bottom. So before when I was talking about carp, Carp do move similar to this. They're not going to be quite as thick. They're going to be a bit more um, skinny and up and down and around. But this is a native fish moving on the bottom. And being the depth that we're in, this is either a very big golden perch or a cod. Um, so I'm just working my lure. So, again, it appears to be connected to the bottom, but that fish is moving with me or moving away and I'm kept keeping up with it. So that's what you're looking for as well is that movement. Hmm. Okay, so this is a, um, a very recent one. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at a fish sitting up in the water column on your, um, on your down scan and then looking down to the right, you can actually see um, that we've got um, a, heap, a heap of um, shadow and you've also got a bit of structure down there as well. Um, so that fish is hovering up high um, not being able to see him too well down on the bottom, you might think that that fish is that um, that mark on the bottom of the screen, but that's actually holding off a bit of structure. So this is a case where, yes, you can clearly see there's a fish on the down scan, but you can't quite see him on um, the down scans, I mean, on the, on the side scan. So it's not 100%, um, but because I can see a fish down there vertically and I can see that really prime looking structure and that undulation in the bottom um, and it's getting harder as it gets out to the right, um, that is a prime bit of um, working the bank and casting. And in this instance, I'd be using um, either uh, a, a blade or a lipless crankbait and just be casting across that if I don't want to disturb too much and go vertically on top because it's quite shallow. Again, this is me um, moving off to the right of that previous one, um, and you can see that I've got a bit more of that actual um, scan there. So you can see that that's actually quite a big cluster of what, 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 what I'm ideally looking for. So you may look at these screenshots and think, oh, you're not seeing too much fish, what are you doing? It's not often, I mean, a lot of people will show you screenshots of fish, oh, that's awesome, you can see the fish, but just as important is what you're not seeing, but you need to be able to understand what you're looking at and look for that structure because they're going to gravitate towards that structure at some point. And that's when, like I said, mark it, name it, so you know what it is, but that is just absolutely prime, prime territory. Just keep coming back to it. Exactly, exactly. I'm just going to um, get off the screen for this one, mate. There we go. Uh, no worries. So this is a good example of finding a couple um, lay down logs um, and there's not too many in Gurdong. So this is actually quite a good find. Um, so you can see on the far right hand side of that, um, the side scan there, how defined that is. So that's, if that was a cod, that would just be monstrous cod or a crocodile if you're an MT or something like that, right? But that is a prime bit of um, lay down structure. Um, and on the left hand side, I'm actually traveling quite quickly. So you've got that disturbance. So you've got that, um, the bubble trail from a motor and that just causing issues there and my, my scan not getting across to that side. So it's not always about perfect screenshots. This is what a non-perfect screenshot will look like on your left-hand side. But you can see on the right-hand side there's a massive difference in contrast. So it's good to know what's good and what's not good because you've got to work them together to get a really good picture of um, the topo topography of what you're looking at. Okay, so here, here we have um, another good side scan image on your right-hand side. Um, and 
There is a fish that's just outside the beam that's holding on the bottom. You can see a little bit of a shadow um, and you can see something that's fairly close to the bottom. So there's a fish that's quite large and in charge just sitting there. And then you've got um, a big depression and um, a big overhang, so you've got that shadow there. So that's just a perfect ambush point. So having that fish sitting there and having some more rocks to the right-hand side of it, having that depression, that is just an absolute prime area that fish will always be around, always. Depending on the water depth, if it rises too much, it might be too cold for them. Um, they may not stick around there, but that is an absolute prime bit of stuff that you always should return to, no matter if it's in a day, months, weeks, years that is what you need to mentally map and physically map that on your gps spots i don't think you could be much clearer than that mate <laughs> i think it was pretty obvious to me that if you're looking for cod you need to mark that spot yeah okay so what, what we have here is um um much of the same um so you've got a bit of your structure on the right-hand side. So directly underneath the boat there, you can see on the right-hand side of the um, side scan split that you've got, got a mark in there. And that mark there is actually the fish that you can see on the down scan. Um, it's, not, it's not super, super crisp where you can actually see um, the fish reveal pop it out, but that is a fish. It's a little bit more um, blurry, but it's a solid blur. So you can also see fish that will pop up to be that solid blur. Like I said, stuff in the water, bubbles, that sort of stuff can really affect what you're looking at. But that there is a fish that's sitting behind that bit of weed. Um, and, yeah, again, a perfect um, example of what you should be looking for when you're trying to find active feeding fish, which generally will be hanging around that bit of structure and wait for those bait fish or those yabbies or whatever to come by. Excellent. Got another question come through from Mark Byrne about using the head to cursor on the structure scan in conjunction with motor guide like you can with down scan. Do you know if that's possible, mate? The head cursor. So, sorry, you touched head, head, head to cursor? Oh, yeah, go to cursor. Yeah, you can do that. So I had a motor guide for many, many years, um, and I used it on my old HDS um, Gen 2 touch as well. Um, and, yeah, go to cursor, no problem. You just got to... Um, you got to get uh, the correct wiring. So there's a gateway kit, and there's also a something else. It's it's, it's out of my mind, but you get two bits, and you got to connect it to your NEMA network as well. Um, and yeah, I think from memory, it used to be like between three and four hundred and fifty bucks for the pair. Plug it in, and yeah, then you hit the go to cursor, and off you go. It's a massive advantage, especially when you want to pinpoint and vertically fish as well, or just hold the spot and cast the bank if you want to work your bigger baits and that sort of stuff. But, yes, definitely go there. If you're thinking about it, do it because you won't be disappointed. Mm, excellent. Then, Matt, we've been through the entire slide deck now. We've, we've had a look at all your screenshots. Um, so how about um, if we've got any more questions, I might let you answer those. Shane Ling's asking about Pinpoint. And I might see if I can bring up that bit of a video, mate, that I haven't got into, oh. the, into the PowerPoint and see if we can play that. So... Shane's question is about pin. Sure, what that means, Shane? Do you, does so that mean anything, you, Roman? Um, if you're talking about pinpoint GPS um, motor guide, then yes, that has the capability of um, uh, go to cursor. Um, I know. I think there's a pinpoint which doesn't have the GPS. You're not going to be able to do that. So, if we're talking about motor guide, I think that's what you're talking about. Okay. So, guys, we are getting towards the end. While I play around and try and get this video up and playing. Um, if anyone's got any final questions for Roman, now would be a good time to ask them. So Mark Byrne has done it already. He loves it. <laughs> Excellent. Good. All right. Um, so I think he's talking there about the uh, head to cursor um, setup for the, the kit that you were talking about. So any other questions, guys, for Roman while I play around with this? So I'm assuming this video is going to be the live site one. Uh, this video is entitled if i can find it you cut 202 uh yeah, one, 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 just play one, it and we'll talk about it but um it's all, all right. good i will be talking about it if it's that live site bit of footage that i'm going to show you i was referencing back to a previous brag pick of a big golden perch so prior post catching that one i was pinpointing or pre actually i caught this smaller one and um i'm vertically 
um, working a soft plastic up and down the tree line. You will lose my lure inside the tree, but if you look closely, it is there and you'll just, I'll explain it um, in real time what's happening and you'll get a sense of the live capability. Um, and yeah, that's another exciting thing about the modern age of fishing. All right. Looks like I'm not going to have any problems sharing it, mate. I'm not sure if we'll get sand. We'll see how we go. I think we will. But let's give it a let's give it a crack. And sorry, it's going to be on uh, not going to be full screen, but I just lost the sound there. Hot, 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 hot. The fish just touched it. Oh, I felt him hit it. He's just here. He's going to drop that stroke back down, see if he follows it. Straight back up and just twitch it in front of this fish's face. The fish just seems to have swum away, though. See if it will turn and grab it, though. Oh, it just got spooked. Okay, let's see if we can get another one to come in because that was looking promising. And then after a little nudge and me giving it a little bit of a shake and bake, it didn't like it and turned back around. So there is a fish. wonder if it's the same one. So there you go. And Shane's made the observation. You just cost me more dollars. I need it. I'll tell you what, guys, people, people think these masterclasses are free and they kind of are, but they're also kind of expensive because you want to go out and buy some gear at the end of them. So. Exactly. So so that actual um, instance was what I touched on earlier. Side scan these fish, changing the frequencies to try and get a bit of separation, identifying those fish that are sitting in that dense um, sticky stuff. So they're really hard to see on the down scan and the side scan. The fish reveal just makes it that much easier, which is why I love fish reveal. Um, and then being able to just pinpoint, sit on top of those fish, and then this live capability gives you that extra bit of something that you can tell when those fish, are, you know, where they're moving, how your lure is working, and that sort of stuff. And it's always evolving, so it's always getting better. Um, but that's just the next level, and I think that over the next few years, this is the biggest um, change when it comes to particularly freshwater fishing in my aspect of fishing. You had your lure changes before, 
You know, you had your spinner baits, your jackal TNs, your bulk, your, your gulp grubs, your, your, your swim baits. This is the next evolution. It's not even a lure. This is it. And it's exciting stuff. And you can get that. I had to work for those fish. I had to work hard, like 20 minutes of um, sitting on them to try and get them to actually hit something. But that nuance of how to work your lure. And again, it's not going to catch you the fish. Most people would have stopped on there, seen those fish follow, may not have readjusted their retrieve and their lure type, but that's the sort of stuff that um, is very exciting. Mm, yeah, being able to see how fish are responding to whatever it is that you change or the you know the different ways you're working the lures, yeah, incredibly exactly. exciting. Mm. And, and mm. Steve Galvin actually has some really good stuff that he's done as well. So if you head over to his page, he's done some really cool little examples of golden perch as well. Um, but yeah, it's it. You, if you want to have a bigger look at that video, go jump on my Roaming Productions Australia page. I um, I post that. I think Lawrence actually posted it today as well. So just go to the Lawrence page. Much easier. Can't check it out. Yeah. So I think we've got one question that we haven't answered so far from Trevor O'Dare. What side of the motor is the transducer on? I assume you must be talking about yeah. one of the previous screenshots. Uh, yes. I won't, I won't try and go back because I'm a bit afraid I might that break the technology. That's okay. I think so. I'll answer both. Um, if we're talking about the boat, I've got it on my right hand side. So I scan on my right hand side, which is why you're seeing that clearer image on the right generally, because I don't have to bypass the rest of the boat and also the motor when I'm traveling with my transom. Um, and then when you're talking about the live side, I've actually got that on a pole set up. So you can put it on the electric, it does come with mounts, but when you're continuously moving your electric and especially if you're using your your pinpoint or your GPS lock, it's always going to be turning. So it can be a bit redundant sometimes. So just get an aftermarket pole done. Rob Payne Engineering up in Queensland does a really good mm -hmm. setup. Um, and there's others out there too. So, yeah, pole if you're going live, live site. Excellent. Now, Raymond, I think we're just about out of questions. Guys, you've got a few seconds left if you want to get another question in. Give it a crack. We'll see whether we can get through another one. Uh, I guess I'd like to point out, Roman, that you are available to help people out as well. You've seen you know, what Roman knows about how to use his technology, whether it's Loransky you've got on your boat or not. Roman's happy enough to come out. Tell me if I'm speaking out of turn here, mate, but uh, I believe Roman's happy enough to come out and uh, and help people understand and get the most out of their sonar. So good opportunity to get in touch with him at Roaming Productions um and you find him on facebook we can put a link up on this live stream as well but um yeah if you need a bit of help here's the man so roman it looks like we're completely out of questions mate you've done well we've gone for an hour and a half and, and we've still got plenty of people here on the on the live stream it's been a thoroughly absorbing and interesting presentation really enjoyed it we've talked about so now we've talked about fish We've talked about tackle. I think we've covered all the bases. So I'm going to thank you. I'm going to thank everybody that came along tonight and participated for all the great questions that were asked and for sticking around for as long as you did and gathering as much info as you have. Uh, it's been been terrific having you here. And also a big thanks to Navica, of course, and Lawrence for, uh, for putting these masterclasses on and allowing us to bring guys like Roman to the screen to answer your questions and do a track with you live and help people to understand their sonars. So once again, Roman, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you in the next masterclass. Thank you, everybody, and good luck for COD opening, which is only oh, a couple yes, hours away. Yes, yes. Probably, have a, lot of, all. probably <laughs> have a lot of people sleeping right now and not doing anything but getting out there first thing in the morning. So good luck to everybody, and, um, yep, I'll be out there soon. And um, Go catch a big one. Go get into them. All right, guys. All the best. Good night.